We're talking with Roland Heeman, one of the most respected and distinguished executives in the history of professional baseball, and among the many achievements on his resume is that he was the original farm and scouting director for the Los Angeles Angels when they began play in 1961. Mr. Heeman, thank you for joining us. Very nice to have to be on and uh, discussing the 61 Angels. That's a long time ago. Yeah, it is definitely a long time ago, and uh, one of the things that I want to ask you about, just starting off with, I think what amazes me is that these days when Major League Baseball goes through expansion, that a, a new uh, franchise will have a good two years to get a farm system up and going, and they can choose players before the parent club even starts to play, and they can put a farm system in place. You and Fred Haney and, and Mr. Autry had all of four months not only to put a major league team in place, but also a farm system in place. So tell us about what the, the mad scramble must have been like back then in early 1961 to get a farm system started. Well, it, it was pretty hectic. First of all, on the expansion bit, uh, Fred Haney and Gene Autry and his right-hand man, Bob Reynolds, of the Golden West Broadcasting Company had gone to St. Louis uh, with the idea of trying to get the radio contract with whomever the franchise would be awarded to. And lo and behold, Joe Cronin, the American League president, said to Gene, well, why, why not you, Gene? How about you buying the club or buying the franchise? And he decided to do so. And they only had about a week or ten days to uh, select the players that were not protected by the other major league organizations. I, I actually did not join the club, the, the, the Angels, until about January 3rd or 4th of uh, 1961, so I wasn't involved in the selection of the expansion draft, but my duties upon arriving in uh, California from Milwaukee was to uh, get a farm system started. We knew that we would try to sign some players uh, for the starting level of minor league baseball, and then we'd be involved uh, in signing players as the season progressed to try to build a farm system. Uh, so we were able to land a working agreement with Statesville, North Carolina, uh, a Class D club of the uh, Western Carolinas League. And uh, it was kind of a makeshift type operation, uh, not uh, uh, the type of ballpark that you now see at the minor league level. And, uh, and we scrambled to get a club going and start uh, uh, a spring training and start the season in, in April. Well, I uh, certainly want to talk more about Statesville and also about the, the AAA team that year, the Dallas Fort Worth Rangers. When you came in in January, you had the dual title of the farm and the scouting director. Was that typical of that era, that one person would wear both hats as opposed to now when they're two different jobs? Uh, in some instances, uh, that was the case. Uh, in other, some other organizations had a scouting director and a farm director, but in our case, uh, we were just getting underway. We didn't know just uh, how much we'd be able to accomplish right off the bat anyway, and uh, Fred Haney gave me both duties. Uh, I had been with the um, Milwaukee Braves organization for 10 years under John Mullen, who was farm and scouting director, and then Fred Haney was the manager of the championship, championship club of the Braves in, in 57, and a club that had a real good run from uh, uh, until the time that he resigned after the 59 season. But uh, during 56, 57, 58, 59, the club was in real contention every year, uh, repeated as uh, National League champion in 58. And after leading the Yankees three games to one, uh, we lost out uh, the last three games. But uh, it, it, it was quite an experience. And uh, the Braves had had a real good farm system, and so it it gave me some prestige that I'd been associated with a winning ball club. So I was fortunate to get this job with the Angels. We started playing our games at Wrigley Field, uh, the old ballpark uh, in downtown L.A. Uh, that had been the, the home of the Los Angeles Angels of Pacific Coast Lake. And not to get too much off the, the, the track here on our main subject, but you mentioned, of course, Fred Haney, who had a very st distinguished career uh, managing and as a general manager, and also your first manager, Bill Rigney, was extremely well-respected, very successful ball player, and managed the Giants before he managed the Angels. Uh, Angels fans of the modern era know that uh, we have a very successful operation with Bill Stoneman and Mike Sosha, but 
go back to the 1960s, I don't know if you could find a, a front office or many front offices that had a, a resume that could match those of Fred Haney and Bill Regney. Well, yes, they did a superb job with an expansion club. Uh, our second year, we made a run at it. We were still in a race on Labor Day, and uh, Fred was named the executive of the year uh, of the American, Le uh, yeah, American League, and Bill Rigney was the manager of, of the year. So we had some great moments uh, at various times during that decade. Well, getting back to talking about building that farm system and the scouting system that first year, you mentioned you came on in early January, and about a month later, Rosie Gildhausen came in, and, and um, you obviously held the hat of scouting director. But from what I've read so far, I kind of gather that Rosie was doing most of the, the beating of the bushes for you, at least early on. So tell us about how Mr. Gilhausen came on board. Yeah, well, Fred Haney had known him in the Pittsburgh Pirates organization, and Rosie was an outstanding scout, very energetic, uh, an enthusiastic guy, uh, hard worker, but a great judge of talent. So. Uh, certainly I was pleased that, and he knew that area of uh, California so well, and he had a lot of contacts, so he was the ideal man and, and did a superb job for us. Uh, we also uh, started a limited working agreement at AAA. Uh, the owner of that club was Ray Johnston, who had been a friend of mine in the Braves organization, and Fred Haney had known him well also, and we split a working agreement with the Minnesota Twins uh, in the uh, in Dallas and in Fort Worth. They combined, they played some games in Dallas and some games in Fort Worth uh, in the American Association. Well, I understand from what I've read, and I, and I don't know if you recall that this happened, but I know that shortly after Mr. Gilhausen came on board, I've read articles in the uh, Los Angeles Times archives that uh, in early February of 61 that the Angels actually held open free agent tryouts at what was at the time called Sawtell Field, and these days it's actually UCLA's home college baseball field known as Jackie Robinson Stadium. Uh, reading through the articles online, I see that there were actually a couple of players that were signed out of that, that try-on camp. Do you have any kind of memories of that particular event? Yeah, the first one, there must have been three to 500 youngsters who showed up. I mean, I, I don't recall exactly the number, but uh, it was uh, – that really helped the sculptor, and, and Rosie ran the uh, the tryout camp when he had uh, some of the scouts that he had known and that Fred had known, uh, Bert Niehoff and uh, Pep Lee, among others, uh, from Southern California who helped him. And uh, and uh, we signed a player by the name of Morris Cigar. Cigar. Yeah, that was our first signing from the tryout camp. And then after that, as uh, the spring progressed, then we signed some players that came out of high school or or college or junior college, um, most of them from Southern California to begin with, as I recall. Well, some of the names. Jack Hyatt. Well, I was going to say definitely Jack Hyatt, who's definitely the farm director today for the San Francisco Giants. Yes. Some of the other names I saw in the Times that were hired out of that uh, open tryout were uh, players who I don't think they ever reached uh, the big leagues, but the names were Bob Rouse, Harold Frost, Norris. Bill Garcia, and, and you mentioned Mr. Cigar, and just to show well, what the times were like, uh, the Los Angeles Times, in reporting that Mr. Cigar had been signed, the article started out by saying that the Angels had signed their first American Negro, which just goes to show you that back then that was actually considered an issue, and that was the way that it was described in the paper. Uh, not to get off on too much of a tangent on racial issues, but I would think certainly um, race, obviously, in that era still – played a large part in, in our society, and I know in talking to Paul Mosley, who pitched uh, the first year in Statesville, he said that when he got to Statesville, North Carolina, that he, having grown up in the San Fernando Valley, he was shocked to see what kind of segregation went on there, and that some of the black players in Statesville, like uh, Dick Simpson, had uh, problems when they got there. Do you have any recollections of, of how racial relations might have affected what you were doing at that time? Well, you know, you had to, to operate under the conditions that existed, uh, and uh, uh, we didn't have a choice really as to where we would take our club. Uh, all the teams had their work agreements settled, and uh, Statesville at the time, as I recall, was the only Class D club that didn't have an agreement of some type with somebody. So uh, we uh, initiated their not necessarily by by choice, but for having a place to play our players. 
Well, I know too that I had. Uh, we have a historian named Bill Moose, who's a local historian in Statesville, who did some research, and he said he had found from his research, and Paul Mosley confirmed this, that Statesville was one of four minor league uh, ballparks still in operation that year that had all dirt infields. I don't know if you recall that, but that must have certainly been a primitive playing conditions for those those ball players back then. Yeah, I know. I was sort of startled when I went there that the conditions were as they were, and I felt sorry for our players. But, again, as I stated, that's the only working agreement we could land. There was no other place for us to to, to basically choose. Uh, all the teams were set in the California League, and uh, we didn't think that we'd have players ready for the California League, some of the better A leagues. Uh, at that time, I think it was uh, Class C California League. Right. And uh, so you had the A, B, C, and D at the lower level, and then you had double A AA and triple A. So the uh, limited agreement at Dallas would give us a chance to play some of the players that had been selected. And we certainly uh, rushed some of those players because uh, Jim Fergosi was the shortstop. He had only played a half year of pro ball at Alpine, Texas, in the sophomore league after signing with the Red Sox organization. Uh, Dean Chance had pitched in the Midwest League at Appleton, Wisconsin, which at that time was either, uh, I think, a C League. Uh, and uh, Bob Rogers had played in Double A, but they were our three best prospects at uh, the Triple A level. Uh, now Hyatt, which uh, we were very happy to be able to sign him. Uh, as I recall, the uniforms were so bad at Statesville that uh, Jack Hyatt had his parents send him. He, he had played on uh, on a team called the Dodger Rookies. Mm-hmm. The Dodgers used to play youngsters in the area, and they'd outfit them in nice, well, good uniforms that with Dodger emblems on it and uh, insignia. And he sent for his Dodger, Dodger uniform and wore it inside out. <laughs> they, uh, now, you, you can check that story with him, but I think he'll tell you it's feel it as we had, and I can't recall his name, and they only had a certain number of uniforms. He called me, said they don't have a uniform, uh, so I said, well, see if you go buy one at some sporting goods store oh, to reimburse you. Oh, my goodness. And he did go out, and he said it was a, a very bad uniform that uh, was too tight on him and not comfortable, but he played under those conditions as well. So it was pretty haphazard. I don't have uh, good recollections of that, but... At Dallas Fort Worth, uh, I remember going to see that team play uh, at some point, and Chance came in in relief to save a game, and Fergosi looked real good at short, and Bob Rogers behind the plate. And I came back all excited that these three players uh, would be ready for the major league soon, and, and they proved that to be, and also had fine careers. Well, let's not overlook also a certain outfielder there by the name of Chuck Tanner, who went on to... Uh Great success with you and the Pittsburgh Pirates, and I think uh, Oakland as well is is a very successful major league manager. And you look at that that Dallas team that first year, you've got three future managers uh, successful in the big leagues: Jim Fergosi, Bob Rogers, and um, Chuck Tanner. Yeah, and Chuck let me know uh, the following year. I think he played uh, for Omaha or Spokane, and I was at a game in Omaha, and he came over to me and said he'd like to manage. So I said, oh, I'm glad to hear that, Chuck. And I reported that to uh, Fred Haney, and uh, we gave Chuck his first job at Quad City in the Midwest League. And he was an outstanding minor league manager and then certainly a very outstanding major league manager as, as time went on. Let me ask you quickly how you found the managers for Dallas and for Statesville that year. For Dallas, it was uh, Walker Cooper. And the gentleman who managed Statesville that year was a, a local boy out of North Carolina named George Wilson. What are your recollections of those two gentlemen? Yeah, well, George was from that area and very popular. And uh, we didn't really have a you know, manager to, to name. And I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name who ran that ball club. Was it Fleet McCurdy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, he, George Wilson, and I said, well, that's fine. And... Uh, we allowed him to become our manager and did a good job under the conditions. I remember sending one of our scouts, Leo Labas, here from New England in the spring since uh, it was still cold up in New England to go help George get ready for the opening of the season with the youngsters that we were sending there. 
Now, Dick Simpson was an outstanding prospect. Uh, he, got, he did get some teeth. He ends up with a, a throat ailment when he was playing at Hawaii, which I think really hampered his career. I forget just the term of the illness, but uh, but he, he was an excellent signing and uh, did end up playing some with Cincinnati in the big leagues. But I had high hopes that he was going to be an Angels outfielder, but that didn't take place. Well, let me ask you about one more player, and then I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, I found some clippings that talked about a, a 16-year-old out of Mexico by the name of Angel, or maybe it was pronounced Angel Macias, who had actually gained some fame pitching for Mexico in the Little League World Series in 1957. I guess there was even a documentary that was made about it that aired on NBC. Yes. And, and I found an article that Jim Murray, the, the you know famous uh, sports writer for the Los Angeles Times, wrote about how this boy came to spring training and he, he was too young to actually sign a contract, but that uh, it was a chance to, for him and his manager, Cesar Faz, to have a chance to, to come up to the first camp there, that legendary first spring training in 1961 in, in Palm Springs. And then I understand when he was old enough to sign, he actually did sign with the Angels. And I've yet to locate any... Uh, records of him playing substantively in our system. I don't know whether he was still under our contract when uh, he was in Mexico in the 60s, but tell us uh, the story behind uh, Mr. Macias and how he came to be in the Angel system. Well, it, it was a nice fit. We were uh, just getting underway, his name being Angel as well. Yes. Uh, Marvin Milk, the assistant general manager of the Angels, uh, had uh, some contacts in Mexico, and that led to... Uh, uh, are trying to give an opportunity to Angel Macias to play for us. I, I don't recall why later on he didn't come back in our system, but he had a, a, a successful career in the Mexican League. And Cesar Faz was a great uh, youth uh, program coach, and that team uh, did win the, uh, I think it was the first Little League World Series. And Macias was ambidextrous also. And uh, had pitched a – did he pitch a perfect game or no-hitter in the uh, – Yeah, he did, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah. So he's still famous down there. And I've seen him in recent years when I've gone to Mexico. Uh, he lives in Monterey. And the uh, owner of the uh, Monterey Sultanas now was a player on that team also. That, uh, that uh, He was a player on that World Series team as well. And he's now the owner of – uh, the Monterey Club in the Mexican League. And I don't know if you're aware, but I know I read an article on the Internet uh, from a couple of years ago that Mr. Macias is actually running a, an academy in Mexico for young Mexican ball players, just as he was helped along. He's trying to now help the, the youth of Mexico as well. Yeah, he was, uh, he was an idol there, and uh, that team has still been uh, uh, celebrated in, in recent years and reunions and uh, the team that they won that Little World Series, and the high-caliber people. I, I know Angel Macias. I've seen him in recent years, and, uh, and Pepe Mayas, Jose Pepe Mayas. They call him Pepe P E P E. Uh, they, they're they're uh, icons down there in Monterey and in Mexico. Well, Mr. Heeman, we're going to let you go. Thank you very much for your time. Again, it's a very rare privilege to hear from somebody who was there right at the very beginning. And as we continue to research and explore into those early days of the Angels minor leagues, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you again. So thank you very much.